Paint polishing can be a scary process given all the misconceptions, and people are usually scared that they're going to burn through the paint or burn through the clear coat. But in reality, it's quite safe if you know the basics, and it can be simple and fun. So in this video, I'm going to share all the information and knowledge that you guys need to start polishing your car at home and get some awesome results. So together, we're going to go over all the basics and all the information from machine polishers to compounds and polishes, also the uh, isopropyl alcohol mixes or paint preps, uh, masking tape, of course the polishing pads and microfiber towels, even things like how to keep your pads clean with the brushes, how to inspect your work with some inspection lights, and also at the end some cool tips like paint depth gauges, so how everything works, and of course well you're going to get all that info. By the way, I don't want you to worry about specific products, tools, or equipment. I'll drop links to those in the description under the video for you guys to check them out, so all you have to do is sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. What we're doing today is making sure you get all the information to understand what paint polishing is. So let's dive right into it. I know you guys are excited. By the way, this is a multiple part series. I call it Detailing 101, where you learn every single step of the detailing process. So make sure that you're subscribed to my channel by clicking the subscribe button that's found under this video, and that way you won't miss my future videos. And I'll also include all the videos from that series. So washing your car, decontaminating your paint, machine polishing, and the application of a protection at the end. So you'll find those links in the description under the video once again. So what is paint polishing? It's also known as paint correction because basically you're removing defects from your paint. So defects are things like swirls, scratches, oxidation, uh, light marring, some holograms, even water sanding or sanding marks that are left on top of your paint. Basically imperfections that you want to remove to help to increase the depth and clarity or the color popping on your paint and also increase gloss. And by the way, machine polishing is the best way to get the most significant increase in gloss, especially when measured with a gloss unit measuring system or a gloss meter. Uh, the reason being, if you're looking at paint from a close-up view, especially through a microscope, it's not flat. It has hills and valleys when you look closely at it. And what happens when you get scratches or swirls through either the washing phases when you're hand washing your car or when you're towel drying your vehicle, uh, if you bring it through an automated car wash with those brush rollers that are brushing, uh, using brushes to remove snow during winter time. Basically, there's a bunch of ways that you can induce light scratches or deeper scratches over time on your paint. Uh, and that has its toll on the clear coat because the way the light is reflected, well, it's not perfect reflection anymore. And you get to see the, those all those defects amplified, especially in the sunlight. Uh, and so to remove those, well, basically, you have to remove a bit of that clear coat to get it down to a point where you're removing those jagged edges that make a poor light distribution and that you're seeing all those defects. And when you're doing the paint correction, well, you're removing a bit of that clear coat to make the surface flatter and truer. And that way, not only have you removed the defects or oxidation, but you're also allowing the light to reflect in a more perfect manner. Hence, you're increasing the gloss. So it's a better way to have an increase in gloss compared to applying a carnauba wax or a paint sealant or a ceramic coating. Yes, paint protection, protection uh, does add a bit of gloss that is measurable sometimes with a gloss meter as well uh, but really the biggest increase once again is going to be through paint correction or paint polishing so well Polishing is all about compounds and polishes as well, right? So you have the machines, we'll dig into that in just a few seconds. But first, there are two types of polishing compounds or fluids that contain abrasives. So of course, think about it. If you have your uh, base metal, so that's the surface to which the primer is going to be applied on the paint, then you have the base coat, which is the color coat, the actual color of your paint. And on top of that sits the clear coat. So it's way thicker than the base coat and it's quite durable because it has UV protection or UV inhibitors as well inside. And that's the transparent glossy thing that you see. So that's the clear coat on all modern cars pretty much. That is what you get. So if you're going to correct that and remove a bit of that clear coat, you need some abrasives. So there are generally two forms. The first one being a compound. So that's the one that is considered the more aggressive and has the uh, bigger abrasives inside there. So see those as little grains of uh, salt or little grains of sand if you want. So basically polishing abrasives that are inside the compound that is going to help to remove those defects. So again, scratches, swirls, oxidation, holograms, sanding marks left maybe from the factory or from some repainting job that you had on your vehicle. Uh, and that's going to 
cut the paint, so remove a little bit of that clear coat and uh, basically yeah, allow it to be uh, truer and flatter and defect free. So you get things like this. This one here is the uh, heavy cut. So this is a compound from Koch Chemie, so a German company. Again, don't focus on the products cr quite right now. That's not what's important here. It's the principles. So the compounds, because they are more aggressive, they cut faster and they correct deeper scratches, swirls and defects. Well, they're usually the first step of the paint correction. And then you're moving on to a refining stage after that to remove the sanding marks that you left with the compound or the marring or the haze left behind with the compound. Because don't forget, this is an aggressive cut. So inside there, you get those abrasives and they're going to leave some effect on the surface. So yes, you are removing defects, but you're usually traditionally going to get some haze left and to further improve depth and clarity remove all that haze and further jewel the surface that's why we call that polishing or jeweling the surface where you're going to finish with a polish so this one here from the same company Koch Chemie a German company this is their fine cut so this is a polish so this has smaller abrasives in there they're not as big and it's not going to cut as quickly, hence why we use it as a polish. So basically, you're perfecting the finish to get that mirror shine appearance at the end. So you have compound, once again, the more aggressive to remove deeper scratches, deeper swirl marks, heavy oxidation. Oxidation, by the, by the way, is that milky white appearance. You're going to see that especially on red cars, right? They tend, when exposed to a lot of sun outside the damaging UV rays, they tend to become pinkish over time and have that milky white appearance. Uh, so if you have oxidation, a great way to remove that is to start with a compound. So then you finish at the end with a polish to refine that to a mirror-like finish to increase depth, gloss, and clarity on the paint as well and of course to remove the haze left behind by the compound. Now if you have a newer vehicle or if the paint is in fairly good shape and it only has very light swirls or light scratches and almost no oxidation, you can skip the compound and only use a uh, polish like this to get the job done. So you always have to decide what combination you're going to use according to well the defects that you have on your vehicle and also to what type of paint, but we're going to talk about the types of paint later on in this video. Of course, you're going to see a few demos done on screen so you understand how the process works. But before we start the machine polishing steps, there are a few steps that we spoke about in the previous videos in the series explaining how you get to that point. Step number one, of course, is going to be to wash your entire vehicle using a pH neutral uh, wax-free car shampoo. So no protection in that shampoo. You just want to use a uh, basically pure shampoo to clean your vehicle. Then you're going to move on to chemical decontamination using, using things like iron removers or tar removers. So to remove uh, embedded contamination uh, like uh, brake dust, of course, that generates a lot of iron particles and also industrial fallout. Uh, if you have tar adhesive or glue marks on your paint as well, those black dots from tar, uh, you're going to use a tar remover. And then uh, when you're done with the chemical decontamination stage, you're going to move on to the mechanical decontamination stage using a clay bar, right? So so a clay bar, clay mitt, or clay towel, basically a clay media that's going to help to remove further embedded contamination from the paint that the chemicals didn't remove. can also remove paint overspray. Uh, it can remove tree sap, uh, a bit of le leftover bug guts, uh, and that kind of thing. So it's going to help to basically make your paint as glass smooth as possible and free of any embedded contamination. Now it is key, especially the clay stage before you polish, always decontaminate your paint because you want to work on contamination free paint. Why? Because when you're polishing, imagine that now you have your pad and your compound or polish that is spinning and you're running that on top of your paint, right? Well, if there's contamination left, that's usually a sandpaper-like material or some grit or heavy contamination in the paintwork. Well, you're picking that up and you're digging it even more into your paint and you're going to create even more swirls and scratches. Hence why we always wash and decontaminate the paint before we go ahead and do paint polishing steps. Paint polishing, by the way, is the general term that we'll use today. That includes compounds and polishes, so the two forms of liquids that you're using to correct the paint. So, um, yeah, that's it. So we prepared for that, and now you're ready to start polishing. Before you actually polish, what is always recommended, especially now, don't forget, all these tips are for beginners. If you're a professional out there and you haven't polished in a while, this is a great way to brush up on your knowledge, by the way, or see at least if you're up to date in the latest and greatest techniques. So this is a great tutorial. Make sure you share this, by the way. Share this video with uh, friends and family that might benefit from it. It's always a good thing to uh, get the uh, people go going out there in their homes and enjoying taking care of their vehicles.
So step number one, uh, before you actually start polishing, after of course you've washed and decontaminated your car, is going to be mask the sensitive parts. So things like uh, grills, your surrounding plastics, and those kinds of things, you're going to want to uh, apply some sort of masking tape. This one here is the uh, 3M Precision that I like, because it doesn't leave any residue or glue type material behind, and it's soft enough to be used on any paint without damaging it. Uh, but basically things like painter's tape, you're going to want to go around and mask all the edges of your trims, especially the plastic stuff because you don't want to leave any of that white polish residue and stain your trims potentially. So be careful and always start by taping that. Uh, the more time you spend prepping your paint, by the way, the more enjoyable the process is going to be, the more efficient it's going to be, and the better results you're going to have. So take a few hours, depending on the level of defects, by the way, people always ask how long does it take? That's a case by case basis. It depends how bad your paint is, what state it's in, uh, what kind of neglect it has seen, uh, but do expect for it to last a few hours. So it is a slow process, but an important one. So set aside at least half a day to a full day to do this, and uh, that way you'll be happy that you did. Okay, so now that we finished masking the areas, you're going to want or you're going to need a machine polisher. Now, this is where all the myths need to be busted because uh, I'm going to recommend things. Of course, we're looking at a beginner's tutorial, but even a person like me who's been detailing cars for 25 years now, I still use a dual action polisher. So there are some rotary polishers out there. Those are the ones where the disc spins in the same circular motion at very, very high speeds. I would only recommend that for more experienced detailers that have more experience paint correcting uh, and of course, well, just know how to operate those machines. And um, yeah, the DA machines, what they do basically, we call them dual action or random orbital. Why? Because the plate here, this is the backing plate, it's going to spin on itself, but it also does a figure eight motion. So see it as a movement of a hand that's doing a figure eight plus that circular rotation. So let me show you here. I don't know if you're going to see on camera. So you see how it's moving up and down at the same time as it's turning. So that is the random orbital and dual action because it does the figure eight and it spins. So the advantage of this is that it is super safe on your paint. There is no worry to burn through your clear coat or burn through your paint guys, especially if your car is in relatively good condition or even if it's an older vehicle, if it hasn't been polished in its life, you're not going to burn through the clear coat. Just be diligent, take your time, do the things properly and you're going to be fine. These dual action polishers do not generate lots of heat. And uh, I remember seeing a video on YouTube from my uh, buddies over at the rag company. They were testing different types of polishers and uh, they were basically wanting to see uh, if you were basically reckless and trying to put damage to your paint and burn through the clear coat, how could you do it? Well, they were almost 12 minutes staying at the same spot on that hood, on the test panel that they had polishing and not moving from there. And it took over 12 minutes of standing there in the same spot spot before they actually burn through clear coat. So it's a wives tale that you have to be worried and burn through clear coat. This is not going to happen. These modern machines work super well and you have the uh, polishing compounds that have lubricating agents inside there and it's very safe. You're not generating tons of heat and you're not removing that much material if you're doing just a few passes and you're doing your normal paint correction. You'd have to do uh, many, many forms of paint corrections on your paint through the years before you actually worry about burning through clear coat. Now this is assuming that your vehicle was never repainted, it was never damaged, and that you have a relatively healthy paint, right? Uh, so always use common sense, of course. So this is the dual action polisher. Now they usually come with variable speeds. We're going to talk about that in a few minutes, but you have this dial on the side that you can rotate. So from speed one, typically to speed six, and that basically changes the speed at which the uh, the plate itself spins. And you're going to have different uh, versions of machines. So this one here has a 5-inch backing plate. This one is a cordless version, by the way. The majority of the polishers are corded, but you can have cordless versions now with batteries that allow you the freedom of moving around. Uh, I'll leave, by the way, uh, some recommendations I have. So not only the products I'm presenting, but some uh, recommendations for entry-level products for beginners, because this one here is quite expensive. It's one of the top-of-the-line uh, companies. It's from Flex, made in Germany. But I'll leave recommendations in the description for beginner polishers that I know work super well for you guys. You don't have to spend, by the way, a fortune to get into machine polishing. When I started 25 years ago, uh, all I had was a Porter Cable 7424 XP. So shout out to all the uh, 
the uh, uh, advanced detailers out there. You probably started with the same one back in the days. So it was an inexpensive hundred bucks, I think, uh, was the the price at the time. You get a basic uh, entry level pad with a few compounds and polishes. And the importance is to go out there and start gaining the experience. You're going to enjoy the process and you're obviously going to see the results. And then you can start thinking of which better pad, which better uh, polisher or which better compound you can purchase and do a deep dive in there because you can go into the rabbit hole quite quickly. Uh, but I have a separate video on that, by the way, for my favorite pads, polishes and compounds combos. So you can uh, check that in the description under the video. So different sizes, you have five inch backing plates, six inch ba backing plates, and um, yeah, you have smaller polishes as well because a lot of people ask, how do you get into the tighter areas or the more intricate areas? So you have polishers with uh, one inch or two inch heads. You have this one here with a three inch head. This is a mini polisher. So it really depends on how much paint correction you're going to be doing. But the most versatile ones are of course the uh, standard ones. You're gonna do 85% of the work with this one here. So a five inch or six inch backing plate is what you'll need to do the majority of the job. And this really is for like the mirrors, the side pillars, the small intricate areas on front or rear bumpers, that kind of thing. So you can equip yourself with different sized polishers. So uh, the next step, once you established uh, your, uh, your polisher, uh, you're going to use some polishing pads. So there are different types. Again, we're not going to dive into all the existing pad types and pad colors, uh, but mainly there's wool pads, more advanced users. We're going to not talk about that today, but we're going to talk about the two main uh, types of pads that you're going to be seeing. So microfiber pads and foam pads. So what is the biggest difference? First of all, typically, now again, this is a generality, but the microfiber pads have a tendency to be more aggressive and they'll cut quicker. Now there are different types of brands, different types of uh, styles as well, but uh, usually a company has its own code. So go on a company that you enjoy, check their website and see what types of pads they have. So these are classics, right, that are enjoyed not only by beginners but by professionals as well. These are the Meguiar's uh, DA correction system pads. So we have the cutting disc which has this uh, red backing. This is out of microfiber and we have their finishing one which is thicker and has this black backing. So this is their finishing disc. So you always get one that's more aggressive for the compound stage and one that's a bit lighter in aggression for your polishing stage. So that was for microfiber. And then you move on, and of course there's different sizes depending on the size of your backing plate, right? So you'll, you'll use whatever corresponds to the backing plate size you have. So if you have a 5-inch backing plate, you're going to want to have a 5-inch pad. If you have a 6-inch plate, you're going to want a 6-inch pad, so on and so forth. If you have a 3-inch backing plate like the smaller polisher there, you're going to want a 3-inch pad like this one here. These are from Rupez. So Italian company, they are known for not only super high quality polishers, but they make their own compounds and polishes, which I'm going to get into in a few moments. Uh, but also, I absolutely love their foam pads. So here, they have many different colors depending on the cut level you're looking for. But the two classic ones are the blue, which is for the compound stage. And you have it in the back. See, it's color coded. So you have coarse. So because this one here has the bigger abrasives. So this is for the compound. And then you get this one here. This is their fine, the yellow one, because this is for the, you guessed it, polishing stage. So again, you'll notice five inch backing plate, five inch pad. You look through the centering hole to put that on there and you apply it through the hook and, loops, through hook and loop systems. So basically when you're having the pads on top of your backing plates, let me show you this up close. So this is close up here, so you see those little hooks. This is basically like Velcro. It's called a hook and loop system. And the pads on the back have this kind of foamish material. So you apply the pad on your backing plate, you secure it, and there you go. You're ready to start polishing. It's that simple. So typically I recommend that you guys start off with uh, two types of aggression for pads. So the majority of the companies have some for polishing and for compounds. So look into the system that you're buying into and uh, get some appropriate pads. By the way, you'll need a few of those because I highly recommend that you switch pads often. Typically, when I do a compound stage, I'll have five or six pads for the entire vehicle. And the same for the polishing stage, I'll have five or six pads for that. Uh, you want to switch pads often and work cleanly. That way you uh, don't accumulate as much of that spent clear coat on 
onto your pad and that spent polish residue. And it's also important to work very cleanly. So when you're working, every time you're done with a section pass, uh, by the way, a section pass, we're gonna talk about that too, but it's you're going up and down and left to right, right, with your polisher. So as you're applying your polisher on the surface and you're polishing, you're doing movements of up and down and left to right to make sure you get even coverage. And over time, when you're done with that pass and you work in small sections, two by two sections, uh, you take your pad and you're gonna clean it. Now, the basic way of cleaning it is using pad brushes like these. So this one here, hopefully you can see this on camera. There you go. It's basically like a big toothbrush and it's made to brush the pads. So imagine that they're sitting on top of your polisher and you got your pad. So you're basically scrubbing that off. You can spin your pad as well with the polisher. You activate the trigger and then you leave the pad, on, the, uh, the, the brush on there and you brush your pad. That's basically to remove any polish residue or spent compound to have uh, always the freshest and cleanest surface possible to work with. Now, another way to keep your pads clean, by the way, that was one brush. This brush here is one from Rupez that they make. So this is their Bigfoot claw. So you have the brush on one side and you have kind of a buttering knife edge on this side so you can spread the uh, polish or compound on your pad. That's pretty cool. And you can also lift the pad from your backing plate with this tool to remove that safely. So I think that's pretty cool. And so you're always it's always important to keep your pads nice and clean when you're working. Because, well, the uh, cleaner the pad, the more cut you're getting. When it becomes too loaded with polish or compound, it becomes inefficient at doing its job. The pores uh, of the, um, the discs become clogged up and you're not doing any cutting anymore. Hence why it's important to clean them. Now, there's many ways to clean your pads as you go. As I said, some uh, brushes here. I know a lot of people like to use forced air. Forced air for me is fine on microfibers. However, you gotta take care because many foam pad manufacturers will tell them that use compressed air or forced air onto the pads can break the uh, gentle uh, foam structure or cells that are in there. So I would be more careful to not really use forced air, but there are pad washing systems that you can use. This one here is from the detail guards. So basically it's a manual action that you have. So it's a tool where you put your um, pad on this kind of plate and then you have a pumping system in a wash bucket and you go up and down and uh, well, yeah, for a few seconds with the cleaning solution that they supply and you can clean that. Or there are some other classics that are a bit more expensive, but things like this, uh, the uh, System 4000 by Lake Country, they're a manufacturer that makes fantastic paint polishing pads, by the way, great, a lot of experience. So basically it's a bucket with a pumping mechanism on top. You're gonna set your polisher, you activate it, it's gonna spin and you're pumping this pump up and down and it shoots liquid to clean it on your pad and it keeps your pad clean uh, while you're polishing your vehicle. So I have uh, tutorials on these on my channel, by the way, again, I'll leave links on how to clean your pads in the description under the video, but work very, very cleanly. That is very important. So always work with fresh pads. And when you're done one or two panels, switch to a fresh pad. So again, the uh, fresher the pad, the better cut you're gonna get, the more efficiency you're getting out of them as well. And always prime your pads before use, right? And some of them have special ways. So for the Rupez foam pads, for example, uh, you can place an X pattern with your polish. You're going to set it on your paint at low speed for 10 to 20 seconds and activate it. This is going to start like pushing all that polish inside your pad. Uh, for microfiber pads, a lot of guys, what they do is you put a bunch of swirls of the compound in there. You can take either your finger or this buttering tool and you're going to make sure you cover all the fibers. So that's how you prime some microfiber pads out there. But again, make sure you have the information on how to properly prime your pad before use. And then it's a matter of you're not using a lot of product after that once your pad is properly primed you're only going to need three or four pea-sized drops that you're applying on the surface of the pad itself and that's how you're going to do your pass when you're uh, polishing your paint okay so next let's move on to using the appropriate polishing compounds so again there are two types Typically, so this is a general rule, you have compounds, again, the more aggressive type with bigger abrasive, and you have the polishes, which is the refining stage to remove the hazing left behind by the compound stage and to give that mirror finish, increase the depth, clarity, and gloss on your paint because the polishes have smaller abrasives. So again, that's the refining stage. 
So uh, there are many, many different systems out there. The ones I recommend for beginners are from Meguiar's actually. So the Meguiar's Ultimate Compound and Meguiar's Ultimate Polish are staples in the industry. They're usually readily available at your uh, local auto parts store or your big box store because uh, they're very popular. They're easy to use. They're very forgiving as well. And so, uh, and they're inexpensive. So you can use that on a more professional level. There's things like Kochemi. So this is their H9. This is their compound. They have their F6 fine cut, their uh, polishing fluid. Uh, CarPro has their Reflect. This here is their polish and they have their Ultra Cut compound. So pretty much uh, all the uh, big brands have their own versions of a compound and a polish. So I like to stay um, within a system when I'm working. So ideally you're going to see like Rupes, right? They make their own polishing pads. Well, to keep it simple, the yellow and the blue. They also have their own polishing fluids so if we look here, again, color-coded for that same blue and yellow. So you get the blue, that's the DA course. So this is their compound for heavier cut and heavier defect removal, the liquid. And then you get the same color combination. You get the DA fine in yellow. This is their fine polishing compound. So this is for improving clarity, gloss again, and that refining stage. So you would use, this is how simple it is, yellow pad, yellow product. This removes all the guesswork out of it. And if you're having the blue pattern for the compound stage, you have their blue liquid, right? Or their blue compound. So you can keep it as simple as that. And then when you gain more experience, that's when you can start doing a deep dive into which uh, compound is the best one suited for your needs and then which polish you can look into. There are tons of different polishing pads and types and brands available out there, uh, but that's not the point I digress. So that's for another video. Again, I have a video on my favorite compounds, polishes and pads combinations in the description for you guys to watch if you go, go wanna go down that rabbit hole but let's keep it simple. So stick to a system that you like and often they make their own pads as well. Uh, Coke Kemi, for example, has their own pads. The same goes for CarPro. And as you saw, Rupes has their own system. So you really can't get it wrong. It removes basically the guesswork of having to know which polish to pick with which type of pad and that kind of stuff. So you primed your pad and now you're ready to start the actual polishing phase. So you're going to take your machine with your pad, of course, it's primed and you've had your two, three, or four pea-sized drops of your polish or compound. Let's just call it a polish for the sake of this video. Uh, basically the liquid that, that's on there. So you're going to apply the face on the surface of the vehicle. That way you're not gonna splatter all the compound and polish in the air when you're activating this. So always put the face down on the paint and then you're gonna lower the uh, speed to speed number two on your machine. So very slow speed to start off and you're going to start spreading the product on the surface. So quickly with your arm speed on this one, but at slow speed, right, for the machine, you're gonna spread the product on the surface and then you're going to increase the speed on your polisher to uh, not necessarily the, the highest speed, but I like speed setting number five. And this is where you're going to start doing the cutting itself. Now, it is very important. Do not apply too much force or pressure on the machine. Uh, you only want to use about 10 to 15 pounds of pressure. Now, what is that? Basically, that's not much. Uh, imagine you're putting your hand on a pillow. Well, if you're starting to compress, you're, always, you're already beyond that. So it's very light. Let the tool, the machine, the pad and the product do the job. So very light pressure. You're going to always keep the pad as flat as you can on the surface. That is key. Do not angle the machine and do not let it wobble. So you want to keep it as flat as possible on the surface because that's how you're making sure you're having the most contact between the pad and the paint. And you're going to use steady and slow arm movement. This is not a race. Don't forget. To do the correction properly, you have to let the machine, the pad, and of course the polishes do their work and you need some long working time. Now don't worry, the polishing compounds and fluids, they come with um, lubricating agents inside there. That's to extend the length that you're working them with and you're going to do a, f a few passes. So up and down and left to right, that's the cross hatch pattern. Overlap your passes by 50% by the way. So when you're going up and you're switching to the next column, well you're going to overlap that first pattern 
pass by 50% and that's to make sure you get proper and even coverage. But again, keep the, pa the pad flat on the surface, as flat as possible, slow and steady arm speed, this is not a race, and do not apply too much pressure on the polisher itself. Let the machine, the pad and the product do the job. That's how you're gonna get the best cut, the most efficiency, and of course, keep your pads clean while you're doing it, as we said. I also recommend that you work in small sections to start off, so until you get enough experience that you kind of understand the relationship between the pad, the type of polish you're using, and the environment you're working in, work typically in two by two sections. That's as much as you'll need. The smaller the area, the better it is for you to control, and uh, you won't be as nervous to try and correct an entire panel at once. And of course, always avoid polishing in direct sunlight. You're not gonna get a good experience. Your products are gonna dry up on you too quickly. The oils are gonna be spent too quickly. It's gonna create more dusting and just a bunch of issues. So always work in the shade on a cool surface or in a garage if you can. Uh, but working cool is also important. The less heat you have, uh, the more cutting you're getting. If you're generating too much heat, the pad itself just becomes grabby on the paint and it's gonna grab through that clear coat instead of cutting it efficiently. The cooler the surface, the better cutting you're getting and the more efficiency you're getting from your pad, tool, and compounds as well. So work as cool as possible and also make sure you keep your pads clean. Now you're done with your pass. So what you have to do now is inspect your work. So you're gonna take a microfiber towel, typically to remove compounds and polishes. I like uh, towels in the 300 GSM uh, type of thickness, so not too thick, not too plush, uh, and not too thin either, but uh, 300 for me is the right spot. I like these uh, th um, edgeless towels from the Rag Company. These are the edgeless 300 towels. Again, links in the description, don't worry about that. Uh, or use whatever microfiber towels you guys want. You don't have to spend a fortune for this, by the way. You're just removing uh, some compounds and polishes with these, but you want some quality things so that you're not scratching or marring the paint when you're trying to correct it, right? So these work quite well. So you're gonna buff all of that compound or polish, depending what stage you're on, but buff it off with a microfiber towel and then inspect your work. Work. How do you inspect your work? Now, if you're working with direct sunlight outside, you can kind of have a look, but the best way to do that is using an inspection light. So you have them in a few forms, things like this from ScanGrip. This is one of their uh, match pens that they have. So here you go, it's like a little flashlight. So you're gonna flash that and look from different angles, right? Up and down, move your head and look at what you're doing to see if there's still any defects left to remove, see if you did anything correctly. And there are other versions like this one here. Once again, same thing from ScanGrip. These are very well known for lighting solutions for the detailing world. So you turn the light on, you can also select different intensities and change the color temperature on the light. So as you can see here, this is a bluer hue for more metallic finishes. And this one here for lighter colored cars like silvers and whites, you get this kind of more uh, close to uh, the daylight color, basically. And then you can turn it off. So inspect your work. Another way to inspect it is to uh, spray on the, once you buffed off, spray an IPA solution on the surface. So you can make your own a 30% or 40% isopropyl alcohol mix. So distilled water and your isopropyl alcohol mix that, that you put in a spray bottle just like this. So you can make your own home solution. This is a 40% IPA. You can use a 30% IPA as well. Or if you want to remove all the guesswork of dilutions and spray bottles, you can uh, buy a uh, pre-made version. This is called a paint prep. Basically, it's an intensive oil and uh, polish cleaner. So this one here is CarPro Eraser, a staple in the industry. Very well known. So this is what we call the IPA stage. So basically, when you spray this on and wipe with a microfiber towel, you're removing any potential fillers that might be contained in some polishes. Now, these ones here are pure polishes and compounds, so they don't contain any protection, they don't contain any fillers, so what you see is what you get. But there are some products out there that might have a glaze inside or some type of filling agents that can mask if you're actually correcting defects. So by using an IPA or a paint prep, you're removing those fillers and you're actually seeing if you've done anything to correct that. And also, when you're, uh, so you, you did that and now you're ready to move on to the next stage. But before you even start all of these, what you can do to know if you've selected the proper paint polish and compound uh, combo is to do a test spot. So you're gonna take a two by two section on the paint and run a few tests. See which pad combination you need and which compound or polish uh, combination you need from your uh, detailing arsenal and see if it gives you the, uh, well, what you're looking for as far as defect removal and overall effect. So if that works, then you know you can use that pad and polish combo for the rest of your vehicle.
So now that you're done doing all the paint polishing steps and the paint looks flawless, right? You removed all the swirls, the scratches, uh, potentially marring, sanding marks, uh, hazing and that kind of stuff. And now it's perfected. It's super glossy. It has that mirror-like type shine to it. And you did your entire paint prep or IPA wipe as well to remove any polishing oils or residue. That is key. So when you're done using the polishes and compounds, because these contain some oils and some type of lubricating agents, that can leave a film on the surface and that can impede or prevent a proper bonding of the paint protection that you're applying in the final stage. So when you're done doing the compound and then the polish stage, you're going to do a full what we call IPA wipe down again with isopropyl alcohol in distilled water or using a pre-mixed paint prep like the uh, Car Pro Eraser, Gion Prep, basically uh, all of the companies pretty much have a paint prep solution. And that again is going to remove all the polishing oils and residue and leave the clear coat as squeaky clean as possible and free of any type of junk that might impede the proper bonding of paint protection. So paint protection, you guessed it, now is the final step. You have to select what type of protection you want. Because don't forget your clear coat is exposed to the elements, is exposed to the UV rays. So you want to protect it against all of that, against acid rain, tree sap, bird droppings, against chemicals, against the UV rays. You want to make the paint easier to clean during maintenance washes. You want those nice hydrophobic properties, right? Water beading and water sheeting, making the paint not only look cleaner for longer, but making easier to wash, easier to dry as well. And uh, so you're going to need to apply a form of paint protection. So once the paint is fully uh, washed, decontaminated, you've went ahead with the paint polishing stages, you did your IPA wipe down to remove the paint polishing oils, well now is the paint protection stage. And by adding paint protection, you're also helping to replenish UV protection, because don't forget, if you're removing a part of that clear coat, you're removing a part of that UV protection that comes inherent with your clear coat. So you have absolutely, once you're done the polishing steps and IPA wipe, to apply your form of paint protection. Traditionally, there are three types, uh, four types, sorry, of uh, paint protection. So there's your traditional carnauba wax, that typically lasts two to three months. It's organic based and has a nice warm glow to it. Then you have a synthetic paint sealant, typically five to six months of protection. It has a colder appearance, but still very nice and glossy. Uh, then more recently in the five to six last years, ceramic coatings are the thing. So many years of protection, higher chemical resistance, uh, better hydrophobic properties, self-cleaning properties, meaning the vehicle is a lot easier to wash compared to other types of paint protections. And an evolution of that recently, the fourth one is a graphene coating, which typically has graphene oxide or reduced graphene oxide RGOs uh, included with a ceramic base, kind of like a ceramic coating. So those are multi-year paint protectant, right? Uh, coatings. So ceramic coatings and graphene coatings. I made a video highlighting, by the way, the differences between those four types of paint protection to help you choose which one is best suited for you. So again, I'll leave a link to that video in the description under this video. By the way, not all paints are made the same. You've probably heard this before. There are softer paints and harder paints. And by that, we mean harder clear coats, and softer clear coats. So traditionally, um, companies like BMW, Audi, and Mercedes, those German brands, uh, they have a harder type of clear coat, meaning that, while well, they're more resistant to swirls and scratches. However, if you do get some, they're harder to remove because the clear coat is a lot harder. Uh, and also traditionally, uh, brands like uh, Porsche, Toyota, and Honda have softer clear coats. So that means they're a lot easier to correct or faster to correct with paint polishing. However, uh, the opposite side of this, uh, the flip side of this is also that they're a lot easier to scratch and swirl. So even within a brand, uh, by the way, if you were used to it a few years ago and you knew that, for example, uh, Toyota had softer paint, well, it can happen that they change paint processes, they change the type of paints that they use and the type of clear coats that they use, and things evolve. So the uh, state of hardness or softness can also change. Even within a brand, within the same year, they can change those processes sometimes, and you'll have different types of paint. So again, that's why it's crucial before you start your uh, polishing stages is to make a test spot. So pick a two by two section and run a small spot with a combination of pads and polishes and see what works best to correct the defects. So it's kind of like a puzzle. You're putting together the pieces to see what works best and what kind of defect removal uh, will perform best on your paint and that will give you the results you're looking for. Don't forget, 
We're not always looking for museum quality results or uh, concours of elegance type results, right? We're not looking for 100% paint correction. Uh, that would take you many, many days and cost a lot of money. And it's just not practical for an everyday use. So if your car is a trailer queen and kept in a museum at all times, then yes, you can go ahead and do or aim for 100% paint correction. But on a daily driven vehicle, anything between 85 to 92, 93 or 95% is more than adequate, especially from a few feet away. Look at your paint. If, if it looks satisfying enough to you, then you know you did a good job. Uh, pat yourself on the back for a job well done. Again, we're not striving for perfection. I know a lot of videos out there. You're going to see experienced detailers uh, aim for perfection. You've seen my videos. I do some close-ups on paint and they're immaculate, but that's a lot of time, a lot of experience, many years in the industry of doing this. And uh, of course, while paying customers, they expect more of a perfection, right? Especially if you're paying for a service. But if you're doing this for yourself, what you want to do, especially if you're starting out uh, with the paint correction stages, uh, well, it's to see a dramatic improvement. So what you're looking for is to dramatically improve the finish to a point where it looks more glossy, uh, it, the paint pops more, you removed a lot of the defects and swirls and scratches, that heavier stuff, and uh, get it over 75, 80, 85% paint correction and you should be very happy. And that's how, by the way, once again, I can't stress this enough, uh, before applying paint protection, the biggest way to have the biggest increase in perceived gloss, either with your eyes or even if you'd measure with a gloss meter, is by machine polishing. So leveling that surface, removing a bit of that clear coat, making the surface truer and flatter, removing those defects and oxidation, will make the light reflect uh, a lot better and brighter. The paint is going to have more clarity, more depth to it. The paint color is going to pop regardless of what color you have on your vehicle. And it's just going to look that much more shiny and that much better looking. Then you apply the, uh, the icing on the top of the cake, which is your paint protection. That just bumps it up a little more and just gives a more uh, awesome appearance to the eyes. So yeah, to improve the gloss, the biggest way to do that, if there's one lesson you can keep today, is that it's through machine polishing. Also keep in mind that there is a point where you can go too far, right? So if the scratches are too deep, and how do you know that? Well, run your finger on it. And if your fingernail catches itself on one of the ridges and you can feel that scratch, usually that means that it's probably too deep. Uh, it probably went through the base coat, sometimes all the way down to the bare metal, especially if you had a, a key job, right? Somebody keyed your car. Usually that's it goes through the primer and always to the base metal. So you can correct paint that's not there anymore. The best you can do is lightly improve that by rounding off the edges of those scratches and swirls and improving the appearance, but you don't want to remove too much of that clear coat because first of all, well, you don't want to eventually burn through the clear coat if you're doing that too much or too repeated or too often. Uh, but you also don't want to remove too much of it of the clear coat because the clear coat itself, let's say there's a certain thickness. Well, the majority of the UV inhibitors that are built in the clear coat are near the top because that's where they migrated to. So when you're removing that clear coat, you're removing a few of those UV inhibitors and the deeper you go, the less of those UV inhibitors you'll get. So you want to be careful. Don't remove too much clear coat. Now, what is a way to know if, let's say a car is new to you. If your car is brand new from the factory, you can polish it many, many times before being able to start to worry or having to worry about removing or burning through the clear coat. Uh, but if you had, let's say you purchased a used vehicle that's new to you and you don't know the history, you don't know if it's been repainted, uh, you don't know the thickness of the uh, paint and you want to dig deeper into that without breaking the bank, right? You can get something like this next PTG, next Diag. This is a paint depth gauge that connects wirelessly to your mobile device. So whether you have an Android or an iPhone and you put this on top of your paint and what it does, it takes measurements basically of the depth of your paint. So on the metal surfaces, because it has to be, it doesn't work on plastics, so you have to apply this on metal surfaces. It's going to measure basically uh, from the primer all the way up to the clear coat, how thick you have either in mils or microns, depending on which measurements you want. And it's going to send a reading to your, the, um, the app on your smartphone and you're going to be able to measure that depth Depth. And then as you're polishing, you can keep on measuring the depth and see how much clear coat you've removed. So ideally, you want to stay uh, over four mils for sure. Typically, uh, paints these days come anywhere from three and a half to five and a half mils, depending on which brand you're using. So clear coats are getting thinner and thinner. However, they're improved in performance as well. So they give you better gloss, better UV protection, better scratch resistance as well. So things have evolved. Uh, and one way to know if your paint has been repainted 
also is usually it's going to be a lot thicker. So if you get an average, let's say a reading of five mils on all your panels, and then you get a fender where the reading is seven or eight mils, there's a huge gap, right? Uh, or a huge difference. Well, that usually tells you that there's a panel that's been repainted because the uh, repainters, while well, they typically repaint them, repaint them by hand, and it lays down a thicker layer of paint compared to where they're done from the car manufacturer by robots spraying it on very thin and evenly. That's how you know if there has been damage maybe on a car that you purchased. Uh, if you see that huge discrepancy in measurements on a given panel and it's way thicker than you think, well, there's a high chance that panel has been repainted. So you can look into the uh, paint depth gauge. Is it mandatory to have this? Absolutely not. Uh, because if you're doing uh, this as a DIY and just for fun, again, you could, you could go through many polishing sessions before even having to start to worry about burning through clear coat. I want you guys to remove that out of your heads. If you use common sense, you use the appropriate tools, uh, products, equipment, polishes, pads, you work diligently and you're careful uh, and you do things right, it would take, you would need to be on that spot again for like 10 to 12, 12 minutes on end on the same spot, applying a lot of pressure before you even burn through the clear coat. So go out there, enjoy polishing your cars. You have all the basic information now to start polishing your vehicles. And um, yeah, I just want everybody out there to, to uh, enjoy doing this stuff. And as you saw, again, we spoke about the machine polishers. We talked about the compounds and polishes. We spoke about the polishing pads, the masking tape. We talked about the microfiber towels, the brushes, the um, inspection lights, the LED lights to inspect, the IPA solutions or paint preps, uh, even the uh, pad washing systems to keep your pads nice and clean. And uh, yeah, when you're done polishing, you gotta clean your pads. Again, you're gonna have the tutorial on how to clean pads in the bottom. So check that out. I hope you enjoyed uh, this series. Go check out the previous videos if you haven't done so yet. So on washing your car, uh, iron removers and tire removers, uh, how to clay bar your car as well. Today you saw the paint polishing, uh, the uh, video for for the, um, the next final step is gonna be to apply the paint uh, protection. So they're already available on my channel. You have a chance of how to apply a wax or a sealant on your car or how to apply a coating. So either a ceramic coating or graphene coating. And that's the final step. So check that out. Smash the thumbs up button to show me your support, by the way. I'll leave all the links to the tools, equipment, and products in the description under the video. Uh, share this video with family and friends. Send it over to them. Get them to understand the basics of paint polishing and paint correction so they can go out there and enjoy uh, paint correcting their cars and making them look glossier and awesome and defensive free as well. And if you haven't done so yet, consider clicking the subscribe button that's found under this video. And that way you'll subscribe to my channel and never miss my future videos. So guys, in the meantime, don't forget, keep it tight, keep it clean, and I'll see you on the next one.